Hello and welcome to the beautiful Rosendale Valley. In this episode, we're going to look at how humans have started to shape the Rosendale Valley. We know that humans have been around in the valley for over 10,000 years, but it wasn't really until the Industrial Revolution that humans really started to shape this valley. During that time, we had the textile industry boom. Buildings like this behind helped to, help to a textile museum were built. This attracted thousands and thousands of people to the valley for jobs. Let's now have a look at exactly how that population changed and how it shaped the towns in the valley. So here we have a graph that shows the total population of the valley from the year 1800 all the way up to 2010. The bit we're interested in is the bit between 1800 and 1900 because we're looking at the Industrial Revolution. We can see here that the population has boomed from 25,000 in 1800 up to 90,000 above the, the year 1860. So in those 60 years we've had the population of the valley nearly coming up to four times as much as it was at the start of the century. Now that is very rapid population growth and that was all triggered by the industrial revolution and the mills popping up all over the valley. These mills attracted people into the valley to work so people migrated to the valley, moved there to live there to work in the mills and therefore the population of the valley grew. But with all these people moving to the valley they needed a place to live. So let's have a look at how the towns have changed over this time period. Starting with 1850 in Haslinden. We're going to look at how Haslinden has developed. So at this time, the population of the valley was around 60,000. However, Haslinden at this time had a low population, only around 4,000. Therefore, the town of Haslinden is very small. But we've still got a town here because we've had some mills building along the riverside. The people who worked in these mills needed somewhere to live and it couldn't be far away from the mill itself because in those days transportation network was poor. There wasn't cars, there wasn't buses, there wasn't. There was only a new train network so people couldn't really travel long distances. They would have to walk or use horseback to get to work. So they needed to live close to the mills. So we've got a small town here. The crossroads in the middle of the town is a market square and that is your centre of the town where you might have a post office. A police station but it'd be very basic amenities at this time. Around this you'd have all your housing and there'd be very basic rows of terraced housing for the mill workers. But for these mill workers they have everything they need to survive. They've got the shops in the centre of town, they've got their place of work in the mill and they've got a roof over their head. So it sufficed for the time. Now we know after 1849 our population is still growing rapidly in the valley and it's going to reach 90,000. Let's have a look at Haslinden when this population reaches 90,000 just before the year 1900. So here we are in 1894. The population of the valley is 90,000 and the population at Haslinden has grown by around about 5,000 people. This growth of population of Haslinden has caused a growth of the town itself. We can see to the south of the town we've had a lot of new houses built. Again, these are very basic terraced housing for the mill workers because we've got a couple more mills that have popped up along the riverside. These mills would need extra workforce, so therefore we needed new, more houses for these workers. The town centre has grown slightly. You've got banks, you've got schools, you've got a post office, you've got chapels popping up around the town centre. Again, easily walking distance still for the people living south of the town. And the people living south of the town can still make their way to the mills I've put as well. So as much as the town has grown, everything is still within walking distance. Now, after this time, the valley's population starts to dwindle slightly. However, Haslinden is an exception. The population of Haslinden starts to skyrocket at this time. So now we're going to look at what Haslinden looks like in the 1930s. 
So Haslinden has grown further still. It's grown out to the east, out to the west, out to the north. And we've had, we're not on this map here, but to the south of Haslinden, Helm Shore has rapidly developed at this time with more housing estates being built around there. This is because there is, again, more mills have been built in the town. We've got a big one to the south, Grain Mill. We've got further ones to the southwest being built. More mills being built in Haslinden increased its population. So we've gone from, it's tripled in size in the, from the previous uh, town plan that we saw. So Haslinden has grown over the years. We've had a small town in the middle 1800s with very few houses and a couple of mills up to a huge town with many mills and a population of 18,000 people. Now let's look at the industry which is causing all this, the textile industry. The main industry behind the development of the Rosendale Valley during the Industrial Revolution was the textile industry. The army is the site that you've seen before. This is the Helmshaw Textile Museum. It used to be a working mill during the Industrial Revolution. But we're in a different part of the mill now. We're seeing here that there is a stream that flows beneath the mill. But why was this mill built on a stream? During the Industrial Revolution, they didn't have all the electricity that we had today. They needed a different form of energy to power the machinery within the mill. That form of energy came from the stream itself. These mills would have had huge water wheels that would have been turned by the river, which would have generated the momentum for the looms to work. So that leaves the valley as a great place for mills to be built. We have lots of tributaries for the airwell and we have the airwell itself. So all these mills were built on streams and on rivers because they could build water wheels next to them to generate the momentum to power the mill. These mills have impacted the towns of the Rosanova Valley in a huge way. They've attracted lots of people to the area. So these towns will have developed very quickly. Let's have a look at what the Industrial Revolution, how the Industrial Revolution had an impact on the structure of these towns. So these new towns that were popping up in the valley, they needed to build Early on in the Industrial Revolution, between 1849 and 1894, the towns that were being built had a very simple structure. In the centre of the town, they had a central business district. This district had all your shops in and all your amenities, such as banks, such as cafes, greengrocers, post offices, police stations, council offices. These were all in the central business district, so that everyone who lived around the central business district had easy access to them. So then after our central business district, we had our residential area of the town, the inner town where people lived. This area was all built up of houses. So people would live around the central business district so they had easy access to the shops and amenities in the centre of town. After that, there was nothing else to our towns. So outside of the inner town was your countryside. So that's the very basic structure of the towns in the valley between 1849 and 1894. Let's have a look at how this looked in Haslinden between those days. So in 1849, we have the central business district of Haslinden. Here you have the market square right in the middle where all the roads meet. And around that market square, you would have shops, you would have your post office, the police station, a bank, all the amenities you need to survive in a town. Outside your central business district, you had your inner town. This is all residential buildings. So all your houses. So this is where your people lived in your town. You had easy access to the central business district because you lived around it, but also you were in close walking distance of the mills on the outskirts of the town as well. Outside of our inner town, we have our countryside, which is the rest of this map here. So our town does get bigger as we move towards the 1900s. So let's have a look at how that town will look now. So 1894, the central business district has grown slightly. So you've got more churches being built in the central business district. You've got a school built, more banks, a post office in the centre, and you've got chapels built in this other part of the town too. 
Outside of that, you've got your inner town, but this has grown further. It's now further south. You've got more housing here. You've got more housing to the east and more housing to the west as well. So our town is growing outwards. So we have the central business district still in the centre, but you've got all your housing around that within easy walking distance so you can easily access the amenities. After this time, this is when our town starts to change structure a bit. Let's have a look at the new structure of a town that we're looking at in 1931. So in 1931, we still have our central business district, our town centre, where all our amenities are. Outside of that, we still have our inner town. We have the terraced housing where the mill workers work. But we start to get a new ring around our towns. So it doesn't head to countryside now. We start to get out of town. Transport at this time is improving. We've got the uh, invention of the automobile. So we've got buses that can transport people around the town easily. We might have a tram network in a town as well that can transport people all the long distances quickly. So this means that we can start to develop the outside of our towns. The outer town is where the richer people in the town live. They would have bigger houses with gardens, driveways for cars because they're likely to own a car. They've got more money, they can afford more land. So in the outer town, you have wider roads for these cars because you've got the new automobile. And you've got more space for these people with more money to make the most of, large gardens to relax in. So let's have a look at where this outer town is in Haslinden in 1931. So here is Haslinden 1931. The areas that we're interested in here is this part here. Rather than our rows of terraced houses that are close together, you can see here that the houses are spaced further apart. The streets are wider and these houses have gardens behind. This is the start of your development of your outer town, your suburbs, where the richer people in your town live. So in terms of the structure of the whole town, let's have a look at that now. The central business district is in the same place. It's got larger still, as more businesses have been attracted to the centre of the town. Our inner town has grown as well. We've had more terrace houses built to the north of the town and to the west of the town. Now our outer town, is towards the south. This is where the richer people are living. You've got larger houses down in the south of the town, the south east and the south west. The reason why this might be as well for Haslinden is that Manchester is located to the south of Haslinden, where a lot of these rich businessmen might have contacts. They may actually work in the Manchester, so they need to be able to get there easily and quicker. So they live closer there to that um, to the city as well. So there we have it. That's how the structure of our towns in the valley has changed during the time of the Industrial Revolution. But it wasn't just towns that were changing during this time. The countryside mills were popping up there too, and these mills were trying to compete with the mills within the town centres. Let's go and have a look at what one of these mills looks like now. So we find ourselves here in Cheetham Valley. This is the site of many mills from the Industrial Revolution. There were 15 mills within this valley. This is one behind me. This is Cheetham One Mill on the Cheetham Brook. These mills provide employment for 2,000 people in the Industrial Revolution. So the big industry up in the moorland as well. These mills competed with the mills down in the bottom of the valley, but they did really well because they made materials out of the waste from the big mills in the valley. So these thrived for over half a century. As we can see behind it, this mill is also powered by our water. This one about a large water mill next to the mill, turning, powering the machinery within the mill. When steam power came to, put, to fruition, these mills started to die down. And then we started to lose the jobs in the area and people started to move into the valley itself. Let's now look at the next industry on our Industrial Revolution tour, we'll look at quarrying. Millions of years ago, the Rosendale Valley would have built a completely different place. 
In the times of the dinosaurs, the Carboniferous period, the Rosendale Valley was in fact a basin with lots of rivers flowing into it. These rivers were transporting tons and tons and tons of sand and pebbles and dropping them within the basin. Over time, these sands and pebbles will build up into layers of rocks and these will then be compressed to form something known as millstone grit. Today, this millstone grit is what most of the valley is made out of. And here right now, I am sat in a millstone grit quarry. This quarry dates back to the 1800s, during the times of the Industrial Revolution. This millstone grit is a very strong building material. Therefore, it's perfect for building the large mills and the towns that were being built at the time. So this was one of the main industries during the Industrial Revolution. A couple hundred years ago, this quarry would have been a thriving community. Hundreds of people working here, quarrying the material, transporting it down into the valley to build the mills and build the towns. Therefore, without this material being here, the millstone grit, that's only found in the north of England, the Industrial Revolution wouldn't have been able to take place as it did. The large structures would have had to be built out of a different material. Material that might not have been as strong, so some of the mills might not have lasted as long as they did. So the geology of the Rosendale area has impacted the development of it from the times of the Industrial Revolution. The reason why this is, this material is very heavy and would have been difficult to transport a long way during the Industrial Revolution. They didn't really have the modes of transport we have today. A lot of materials would have been had to transported by horse and cart. Transporting large blocks of building material by horse and cart would have taken a very long time. So they would have only travelled short distances. The short distances I'm talking about here is from the top of Graham where I am into the valley into Helmshore. And it's likely that the Helmshore Textile Museum was built out of this material. Not only the Home Source Chatsar Museum is built out of this, but if you look around the valley, look at the buildings that are brown or sandy in colour, they're going to be built out of this millstone grit, which will have been quarried in the valley, because it wouldn't have been transported from a long way away, because it was too difficult to do so. So, our industrial revolution is built out of this material. Large mills that produce textiles built out of millstone grit. So these textiles that are made in the mills, they need to be sold, otherwise there'd be no point living in the Industrial Revolution here, there wouldn't be any money there. So we need to transport these textiles somewhere to sell them. The likelihood is they'd transport them into Cottonopolis, into Manchester, which is just south of the valley. To do that by horse and cart would have taken a long time, so they needed a new mode of transport to do this. That mode of transport was the rail network and steam trains. One of those surviving steam train networks that's in the valley now is the East Lancs Railroad. So let's go and have a look at that now and how that influenced the Industrial Revolution. So here we are at our last surviving rail network, the East Lancs Railroad. Nowadays it connects Rottenstall to Haywood, just south of Bury. However, at the time when it was built, nearly 200 years ago, it was part, part of a huge nationwide rail network, running all over the UK. Now this came about because of the invention of the steam engine. Fantastic technology for the time, which really sped up and revolutionized transport. Moving from horse and cart, which would have taken days to travel tens of miles, to just a couple of hours on this rail network. It was really important for the industrial revolution because it transported the goods from the towns in the valley to the large cities, such as Manchester, to sell the goods and make a profit. It also made it a lot easier for people to travel around this area. People who had lived in the valley for their entire life and not travelled out of it now have an easy mode of transport to see the rest of the UK. But it wasn't just for travelling local areas, between local areas. People used these rail networks to migrate. Now with these mills coming up in the Industrial Revolution, this allowed new job opportunities in the area. So people had to migrate to this area to work in these mills and to earn more money. So they used the rail network to do that. And at this time, this is when the population of the valley boomed to 90,000 people. But it wasn't only national migrants, people migrating from within the UK 
to come and work in these mills. We had international migrants too coming and working in the mills. Steam power wasn't just limited to the rail network. We had new steam powered boats which could travel long distances a lot quicker than sailing on sailboats. So people could now migrate from all over the world to the UK. At the time, the UK had a large empire, the British Empire. This rule stretched all over the world, especially to parts of Central Asia, now known as India and Pakistan. These countries were very poor at the time, so people wanted to migrate to Britain to come and work and earn more money. These opportunities came up in the mills. So people travelled by steam boat to the UK and arrived in ports such as Liverpool. They would then join the rail network and work their way up into the valley along this railroad here and they would work in the mills in the valley and now live here. You can see this in Haslinden today. The people who live in Haslinden, there is a large Asian network. These will be the descendants of the original migrants who moved to work in the mills in the Rosendale Valley. Now we're talking about this fantastic new technology, steam power, but what actually powered it? The fuel source for the steam power was coal. In the northwest we had a large supply of coal. Let's have a look at one of those coal mines now and see how they fueled the industrial revolution. So the industrial revolution is really thriving down in the valley. We have the large mills that are powered by water. We have the invention of our steam network, which is allowing people to migrate to the valley. Now the invention of this steam technology allowed the mills to convert to steam power. This means that the mills were more efficient. They could generate more energy to power more machinery, provide more jobs for people. Build bigger mills as that, as that because they more, can generate more power. So that would allow more people to migrate to the area. But this new technology of steam power needed a fuel source. And the fuel source in the valley was coal. The reason behind this, that is in the valley, we have an abundance of coal. As within the millstone grit, there are thin layers of a shale rock, like this here. This is very soft rock, it's very brittle. And this rock found millions of years ago, at the same time as our millstone grit, but in old bodies of water, such as lakes, rivers, marshes. Now when plants and animals died millions of years ago, they may have fallen into these bodies of water and be preserved. The carbon in them would have been preserved. And this would have been preserved in the form of coal. So as more and more layers of rock and coal formed on top of each other, this would have been preserved underground for millions of years. Come the Industrial Revolution, this coal is dug up and burned and realised that we can burn this at very high temperatures and generate steam from it to turn turbines to make energy to power the machinery in the mills. So lots of these coal mines popped up all around the valley. Behind me is an example of an old coal mine. These would have lined the valley sides, they would have mined the coal here and shipped it down into the valley to power the mills and the steam train network. Now this job was a very dangerous job during the Industrial Revolution. They would only have candlelight to light the way in the mines. Now this is a very flammable substance coal. So if you dropped a candle on this coal, it could set the seams of coal alight and it could burn for weeks, days, months even. So these jobs were quite well paid during that time. So people migrated to the valley to work in these mines, again, up in the population of the valley. Now coming out of the Industrial Revolution, Coal mining died down in the valley as the mills started to die down in the valley because they used to, they moved abroad due to globalisation. So there's less need for the coal in the valley. So these started to shut down. The coal mine that I'm at here was the last remaining coal mine within the valley. It closed around 2014 and it's Hilltop Coal Mine near Baycup. You can see we've still got some of the machinery behind me. There's a conveyor belt there which used to move the coal out of the mine ship it to the surface where it could then be shipped by quarry, by quarry to the coal power plants. Now the reason why we've gone away from coal in the valley and in the UK as a whole as it's not sustainable. Once you've burnt coal you can't burn it again it's gone. So we need to rely more on renewable energy. Also over my shoulder you can see a wind farm. Now this wind farm generates renewable energy that is good 
for the environment too, as it doesn't produce any carbon dioxide, which causes global warming. So we're coming to the end of our industrial revolution now. Let's go back to the textile museum for a summary. So there we have it, we've come to the end of the industrial revolution. The valley is booming. There's thousands of people live here. There's 90,000 people live here. There's mills in every single town and village in the valley, providing employment. However, industry is now starting to decline in the area. Due to globalisation, industries are moving abroad. So every next time when we look at what happens to the industry in the valley, how it changes and how it shaped the valley to modern day. Mm -hmm.